You know, this is the irony. Uh, you know, that you've said. I just quote it back to you again. I just think it is so well expressed. So long as Western society continues to deify safety, it will remain in thrall to the culture of fear, and nothing is more inhibiting, more soul destroying than living in fear. One of the things that's really struck me during COVID in Australia, though, a uh, little motto with these. Um, uh, the, the behind the, the, the conversations that I hold is that you can't get good public policy out of a bad debate. If it's truncated, cut short, silenced, not followed through, not reason-based, if people can't ask questions, you won't get good policy and people won't own the policy outcomes. And we see all of that playing out in our country at the moment. And what struck me was the incredible emphasis on the health aspects of COVID and lockdowns and the measures being taken without, we've touched on this, the people being given uh, a proper and informed diagnosis or, 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 or information around the other issues, the mental health issues. The, um, uh, the University of Sydney has a, a medical unit that specialises uh, on uh, in, um, uh, in suicide. And, and they were saying that the likely increase in suicides would be threefold amongst young people, massive across the nation, and outweigh deaths from COVID before Delta came along. It had almost no airplay. But for the people to make an informed decision about balancing things up and facing some tough realities and breaking fear, free of the sort of fear that drives you to security. And then there's the economic side of it, the explosion of debt. We are paying our way through the crisis with our children's money. And those raw things are not put before people. So you're not getting this sort of it's the end of the age of reason, I suppose, is what I'm saying. You're not having a full picture put before adults, let alone children. Well, this relates to our earlier discussion because what's happened is that public health has become incredibly politicized in recent decades to the point at which public health is everything. I mean, every uh, aspect of our lives has got a public health uh, solution or, or a public health interest in it. And I think that what has happened is that uh, once public health becomes politicized, it becomes one of the major vehicles through which politics is conducted. And that's why I think what we've seen in the, in, during the COVID pandemic is a, a steady expansion of the role of public health in our lives so that it kind of pushes everything out of consideration. It, it is the only game in town in a sense and everything else from economic life to cultural life to young people's capacity to enjoy freedom in the outdoors, they all become subordinated and assessed from the point of view of public health. And I think that kind of uh, philosophical standpoint is really important because public health is really the medium to which uh, moral engineering and social engineering is most effectively conducted. Because what public health does, doesn't it doesn't just simply make us feel healthy. It gives a uh, a set of values to us about what health is really all about. It becomes a, 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 a kind of a, an invisible way in which values and norms that have been recently constructed and created are circulated. And we're not aware of that because it's public health. Uh, that's the way it's really seen. But what we're doing is we're medicalizing our, our lives, social experience, to the point at which we become disinterested in real political, real economic issues. So, uh, you know, going back to what you said earlier, you were warning and people are saying you were exaggerating about the dangers of safe spaces in universities. Then universities became safe spaces where you're not allowed to put a contrary view for fear of offending somebody, which challenges their very uh, feeling of, of safety and of well-being because we're, we confuse feeling with thinking. But in a sense, what we're now trying to do is to say to our governments, create a whole safe space uh, in the context of COVID. Exactly. And basically, that's another way of saying uh, you become mommy and daddy. You know, we're little children that need to be protected and insulated from the experience of everyday life. And that's the message that's come across, particularly in Australia. I think Australia is a very interesting and an extreme case, particularly for, for an outsider like me, because I remember when Australia uh, was defined by its robust can-do attitude. I remember you know, my wife and I being you know, impressed and, and loving the attitude of Australians in the way they made their way in the world. And, and then I remember coming back to Australia a little bit later and my wife and my son 
were on a bicycle uh, somewhere in Queensland in a, in a, on, a, on a golf course, just bicycling around. And the police car kind of pulls up and gives me a lecture you, you know, that you know, I'm not wearing a helmet, my wife's not wearing a helmet, we're still my son's not wearing a helmet, and we're in a golf course. You know, there's no traffic there whatsoever. And it really brought home to me how this safetyism, this obsession with safety, had become institutionalized so rapidly and so fast in Australia that the old ways uh, are in danger of being sidelined, that kind of robust can-do attitude. I'm sure it's still there, can become to some extent marginalized. And I think we need to be aware of the way in which this kind of attitude towards safety ultimately dimish, diminishes the quality of our lives and diminishes the, the potential, the human potential that we have in, in being creative and, and transformative. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.